Hello, Aki Burmese. Oh, Stevie, it's good to see you once again. It is good to see you. It is good to be seen. It has been many a star date since last we convened to talk about Star Trek Discovery. It has. But, uh, yes, we're both looking great. Yes, we do. From from our excursions about the world. Mm-hmm. And we are back for this last, this final few episodes of Star Trek Discovery. I can't wait. And I'm also devastated that it's about to be over. Forever. Forever. Forever and ever, amen. Unless they make a movie. Maybe they'll make a movie. You ever think about that? Do you ever think about that, Alice Kurtzman? Hmm. <laughs> Disco the movie. Disco the movie. I have a feeling they won't do it. I don't think it's got I... enough love across the Star Trek universe, right. unfortunately. I Listen, I'm a New Yorker born and bred. There's nothing I hate more than L.A. But if you think I wouldn't move to L.A. to start a whisper campaign to get a Star Trek Discovery going, you got another thing coming, Kurtzman. Okay, <laughs> and Michelle Paradise. <laughs> All right, you're about to have you're about to meet a new best friend in a bar and wonder why you met them, and then for five years they'll go closer and closer and closer to you, and then suddenly they'll incept you with the idea of doing a movie of Star Trek Discovery five years later. Incept. I like that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Oh man, are we, are we doing a show? Or I think we should do a show. Or am I just having pre revenge fantasies? Let's do it. Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Welcome in to the show proper. This is Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. And today we're talking about Star Trek Discovery Season 5, Episode 7, entitled Eriga. It is start at 157.526.2. And for those of you who don't know, this is just a quick backup. An Eriga from the Breen Imperium is just a blood bounty and it can only be solved by blood and they coming after your blood and you can't get away and everybody's gonna kill you or demand you back for blood so that's the name of this episode Eriga not Erica a lovely name but Erica Ooh, you know Erica is a lovely name I would I'd be I'd, if I had a child I might name them Erica which is why I shouldn't have that kind of responsibility well I did think it was like did someone just get lazy and think Erica Oh, Eriga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you've read as many fantasy novels as, as I have, you go, what did you just see Charles and then change the A to a Y? And they're like, my best friend, Charles. You're like, good Lord. Come up with names. These fantasy names. I'm just saying. Eriga's would be one. Michael often gets changed to like Meek, Meek, Meekal, M-E-E-K-A-L, stuff like that in fantasy novels. Do you want to run down the episode, or I mean, I'm happy to talk to you about. I have I have books right here. I could probably pull some terrible definitely names from. Let's run it down. Okay, all right, not not the book thing. Let's run it down. It's time to run it down. Can you run it down for me? Talk about the car down. Run it down. Hell yeah, last time, uh, Maul and Locke are Breen and human? Couriers incurred some damage, and he, he was pretty injured, and he ran away. That was actually two episodes ago. But now he's been found, Locke and Maul, whose real name is Maline, who is the daughter of Cleveland Booker. They're being held on the locker, and Disco has been ordered to go and transfer them so they can be brought to Federation HQ. We meet once again Commander Nan, who is a security officer who don't take no junk from nobody. Also, not even from books. She's immune to his beautiful looks and his plaintive British space druid 
emotion. He's like, please, let me help. I've known her better than anyone else. And you need a courier like me to bring you in. And she's like, you can, if I need you, I'll let you know. And she says she was only nice to him because Michael loves him so much. We finally, we see Locke. He's in bad shape. He's in sick bay. Sick bay. Mal, very, very angry. But Michael goes to bat for them. And basically, they are, Culber is going to scan them. He puts up a field. He says, some vital organ of Locke's has been hit. They don't know enough about brain physiology to heal him. Obviously, this would be a huge diplomatic issue if... Uh, a Breen died in Federation custody. Culber does have a plan during the Dominion War. He did some research. There's evidence that Breen can regenerate in extreme cold. And they have captured a Breen fridge unit, uh, which they can make into a cold ICU unit, which maybe will help Locke recover. So that's the plan. Michael, they get to HQ. Michael jumps to HQ, has a... No, before they get into HQ, there's a classified communicate with Admiral Vance, which Michael takes in her ready room. He says, I'm going to get you this fridge that you need, but you're going to have to hold on to Mal and Locke because they've gotten a message from the Breen Imperium regarding the Araga. Somebody from the Breen Imperium is on the way and they want those prisoners. So Disco, keep Mal and Locke and go far, far away from Federation headquarters because the Breen are coming and they're bringing a dreadnought. President Rillick is on Telar Prime, and the Federation is going to hunt down otherwise. But Michael has an alternative plan. Michael says, let's have Disco stay and force some diplomacy. Bringing us to a meeting of the diplomats. Diplomats, diplomats, diplomats. Rainer, Vance, Michael, and Trina, President Trina of Navarre. Trina has been delegated by President Rillick to lead these quote-unquote negotiations with the Breen, has done some research, there's been no contact with the Breen since before the burn, but they know that there's been some unrest in their Imperium since the death of their Emperor. And now there are six Primarchs who war for control of the Imperium. We don't know which one is coming to Federation HQ. Rainer expresses some dismay that we're going to try to do diplomacy with the Breen because he thinks they cannot be trusted. I wonder why. What don't we know about your backstory, Rainer? Well, we'll find out about that later. Anyway, he gets so upset he has to be dismissed by Michael. And Michael and Vance and Trina basically discuss finding something they can use to trade to negate for the Araga. And Michael knows that this Breen Dreadnought is coming into Federation space, taking a risk for themselves in order to get these prisoners. So there must be something more here, some ulterior motive as well. It is mentioned, by the way, and I, and I think an Easter egg for the future, that Saru is on a mission near Breen space. So I feel like we're going to see Saru get Breened. I don't know what I'm trying to say there. They are going to try to do this plan, and Vance counsels Michael to keep Rainer in check because he seems like he's got something going on. Michael does go to speak to Rainer and says, wonders if it's personal. And Rainer says he said all he has to say, and he apologizes for his tone. Disco goes to yellow alert, baby. Meanwhile, Stamets runs down Tilly, who was going to head back to Federation headquarters to uh, be with her students. And he says, we need you here. You got to help solve the problem with this last clue. We got this Beta Z logo, which reads the Labyrinth of the Mind. And Tilly and Deer could work on that clue while Stamets is working on the, the like technical part of it. Like, where does it come from? And they need Tilly's help. He's able to convince Tilly that the most important thing in the Federation right now is figuring out this information. In Sick Bay, we see Locke is slowly improving in the cold ICU. And Michael approaches Mal and Locke, who are in their force field, and says, is there anything they can offer that will be payment? There's a dreadnought headed this way. Some Primarch. Why does the Primarch want them? Basically, through a series of question and answer, and Michael being a deft reader of body language and micro, micro, uh, small moves in your face, microfacial, micro moves. Micro expressions. Micro expressions. Whew. Yes, Michael is able to determine that what we knew is that Locke is is attached. His uncle is the Primarch, but we find out, I don't know if we did know this exactly, that Maul is directly descended from the Emperor. And so the Primarch that's coming, that is his uncle, wants Locke not simply to kill him, but because Locke would help him get the throne. And once Michael realizes this, she's like, hmm, I think I have an idea. But Locke is like, when my uncle gets here, spit in his face for me. Tilly and Adira 
are trying to work out what's going on with this Beta Z clue. They find out it's the title of a manuscript written by Dr. Marina Durex, who was one of the scientists who hid the progenitor's technology, which is the overarching mission of this whole episode series. Also, it seems like there's no copies available, but this might have come from the original handwritten manuscript oof, 800 years ago. Adira suggests a search to find someone who might have some knowledge in ancient manuscripts, and Zora does turn up uh, a rare antiquarian bookseller, Commander Reno. So Adira and Tilly go to find Reno, who's working on the targeting matrix and getting ready for the Reno show up, and is happy to talk to them and give them some help, but they're going to have to walk and talk uh, with her a la... Uh, a Thomas Schlame, and that's a deep cut from my West Wing heads, uh, the walk and talk shot. So, yes, Reno used to be a smuggler for a shady antiquarian archivist. It is revealed that Reno had many strange jobs before becoming a Starfleet officer, including Ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-ah-
demanding the prisoners. And Trina says, oh, well, but I'd like to use the remainder of our time for a little conversation. And Trina has learned the language, so she's able to speak directly uh, or to understand directly what the Primarch is saying, allowing the Primarch to speak to her directly so that there will be no misunderstanding. They offer 45 metric tons of tri dilithium in order for them to lift the Araga, and they're told that only blood can lift the Araga. Trina says then that they are going to offer the hostages to Tahal. And this seems like part of the bluff that Michael came up with because they have an interest in Locke. Rune, however, is not fooled by this. But then Rainer speaks up and Rainer, knowing Tahal well and knowing about her flagship, the Tau Ceti, named after a lethal viper that she used the slow acting venom of to kill people when she wanted to delight in their slow death. Also, apparently he fought her and she would have killed him, but she liked how he fought like a Breen, she said. And it's Rune to say, okay, maybe they, maybe they truly did speak to Tahal. So Rune says, but he's like, give me the prisoner or I will destroy this whole station. I think he might even say smithereens, which can't be possible. I must have added that. He didn't say smithereens in this episode. That's not something a Breen would say. I think he said to splinters or shrapnel or something. But in my heart, he said, I'll blow this station to smithereens. Trina calls his bluff because they're like, you need luck, baby. Meanwhile, in sickbay, Maul gets the guard's attention, says that she needs to talk to the captain. And while she's doing that, Locke opens up his medical unit and overdoses on some sort of green stuff. Everything the, the green do is green, baby. Causing Culver to bring down the shield as he goes into critical mode. Maul begins an escape. She fights off all the guards. She fights with Culver, who does hold his own pretty well, but he was trying to doctor. So he gets knocked out, but then opens the door. And who's there? Commander Nan. They fight, but there's dust, and so she manages to get the drop on Commander Nan and run. Rune, meanwhile, in Star Trek, uh, Primarch Rune, says he will accept this. Well, what he says first is that he's going to give them more than Primarch to hogism. But then Trina's like, we don't care about that. How about this third option? We give neither of you these prisoners so that you and Tahal are fighting on equal footing. You leave here in peace. We keep the status quo the same. And later on, we can figure this all out. Rune relents, but he says, if any harm should befall the scion of the emperor, then war will be inevitable. It is his sworn duty. And just at that moment, Burn, uh, Burnham is called away because as we know in, in sickbay, uh, terrible things are happening. Uh, they get to sickbay, lockdown protocol. Uh, Maul is in the wind, Locke is critical. Uh, Maul has some sort of biometric cloaking device that makes it hard to track her. Uh, and Culver needs a brain medic to fix what's wrong with Locke now. And Michael's like, I think I can get you one of those. Nan goes on the search. Meanwhile, Book, who's been helping Stamets try to figure out where the metal is from, finds out that the fugitive has escaped. He wants to help. But once again, Stamets keeping people on task is like, you got to stick to the mission. And something that he says about the book helps Samus realize that there might be an empathic link. After all, we're talking about Betazoids, baby. So he asks Book to try and connect. Book does his space druid thing. It's pretty hot. And then he discovers an empty remote part of space with a huge cloud, a plasma storm, and a feeling of eternity. And that gives them a little clue to narrow down where this, this, where this metal thing wants to go. And then he goes off on the hunt to find Maul in sickbay. Michael's able to get a brain medic, but also the Primarch is coming. And so they come down there and they start treating Locke. Book joins the hunt. He meets up with Commander Nan, who apologizes for giving the brush off earlier. He's like, fine, I'm just here to help. They find Maul, who's holding someone hostage. They tell her that Locke misjudged the dose and might possibly be dying. She doesn't believe it. So Book has to go out there and try. And once again, super duper em empathy man. He's like, listen, she's not lying. It's true. You don't want to run. I've lost a whole planet. You want to be there for him. You want to be there with him. And so he convinces Maul to go back to sick bay to be there with Locke because he might possibly die. If he dies, nota bene, there will be hell to pay. She gets there. Locke is fading, but he's able to say a few last words to Maul and say, you're going to be OK. I promise you. And then he flatlines. And then the Primarch is upset and he says, prepare for battle. And then all the Breen jump away from HQ and then red alert shields up and Rainer's like, we got to strike first. We got to strike first. And just as things are seem like they're at their worst at that dark tea time of the soul, four warp signatures come up on the screen and they are Starfleet. 
And so finally, truly, the cavalry has come to the rescue. They face off with the Primarch, but the uh, Primarch's troops, the Primarch's still at sickbay, does not believe the Federation when they say that Locke did this to himself. Maul, who's there, tries to convince him of the truth and also reveals that she and Locke are married. So even though it's considered a, an abomination, they have some sort of skin thing, tattoo dealy that allows people to know that they've been married and she says you're obligated to take me with you and she reveals that she has the clue to this technology that could help them overthrow all the galaxy or whatever and she'll give it to them if they take it with her and so the primarch's like um if you don't want to have war then let me take her and get the cool stuff and so the council is convened he's like you have five minutes to talk about it so they talk apparently there is some discussion that dr velik who was the original person that sent us on this path with the progenitor's tech believe that the tech could bring back the dead and perhaps that is what Maul's uh, motive is here now that Locke is dead. Book is very upset that they're considering giving over this prisoner just to avoid war but Trina rightly notes it's the best thing to do. It's, we'll save the most lives it will give us more time and so they give Maul to the Primarch and Book makes it known that he thinks this is still wrong. Meanwhile, we get the rundown on where we're going next. This next clue, the Eternal Gallery and Archive. It changes location every 50 years. It is now presently, based on all the clues and everything that they have, somewhere in the, quote, Badlands. And it's time to jump to the last clue. So Michael and Rainer head to the bridge. We get a black alert. And there endeth Episode 7 of Season 5 of Star Trek Discovery Erica. Let's chat about that. I say, darling. Let's do a quick chat about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes let's, let's do it. Great episode. We get all this Breen stuff, the six Primarchs fighting for the Imperium, the control of the Imperium. We find out that Locke is the is the a direct descendant of the Emperor who died. I don't know if we know how the Emperor died, but so now we get this like Breen stuff that's happening as well as this progenitor check race. I, I didn't think that Locke was going to die. And you know what? We talked about doing Faith of the Heart, but I'm not sure he's going to stay dead. I don't think so either. You think they they take his body to the progenitor's tech and he comes back and he's like, I've always loved you and turns into like a super green. I mean, green. I have no idea. We don't know what this progenitor's tech is yet. We're assuming true. it can do things like bring. Yeah, we honestly don't know. Dead, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. If he doesn't come back. Then Maul's gonna be pissed. Maul's gonna be pissed. She's Maul is existing in a state of pissed offness, and that was when she had the love of her life with her. I can only imagine how she's going to react. Now, let's see. I did enjoy Reno Reno's past being unveiled. A truly checkered, truly the use of the term checkered past could be applied to. She's just one of those characters where. You can bring in anything for her because we don't know enough. <laughs> yeah, she's like, you found me keeping people alive like there were machines on a crash ship in season two. And my backstory, pretty wild. She'll just come out with something that says, oh, yeah, this one time I was on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Rise of two and blah, blah, blah. You know, like she, she'll just come out with like some sort of Trek lore canon thing. Yes, she was there. She, she was, was there. there. She was the, the OG. Well, she gives us this archive, the, etern the Eternal Archive, which seems cool. And I think this next episode, I'm interested to see what the what this library trip yields. For sure. I do. And then we'll... Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I feel like Reno is... She's not like... Obviously, she's not Guinan. She's not like a Q. You know, yes. whatever. In fact, sorry, she's not a Q. But she's like a Q. In yeah, the, not some sort of eternal, yeah. you know, omniscient. Totally. Whatever. But I feel like she's this sort of character where they're like, oh, we need to find someone who knows a little bit about this. And like, and then that was when Picard would go off to Guy and say, I've got this perplexing tr problem. Yeah. I don't suppose you know anything about this race, do you? And mm -hmm. then Guy would be like, yes. Ooh, you want to stay away from them or whatever. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like <laughs> Reno is that character for Discovery. It's like, oh, yeah, totally. I knew about them. Oh, yeah. Ancient books. Yeah. I used to work for a smuggler. Yeah. You should check out the archive. Yes. But I thought it was wonderful. I do also love that whole scene 
where Reno just keeps working, but is trying to help them solve this mystery. It's like Reno's always doing 14 things at a time, but can also, is like, got to make sure these fiery matrices are, are on point. Let's see. Oh, the Breen showing up on the, on the, in Federation HQ in their big old ship. And they're all like, blood is blood, whatever. And I'm the Primarch, and I'm here to show you how it's done in the Breen Imperium. We're going to take my, my nephew, and we're going to make me Emperor, or whatever. That's the voice that I feel like connects to his vibe. I see. In that moment. So it's giving yeah. me, do you remember Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. The guy with the, the arrow thing. That's right. The, his, his dad, yeah, yeah, or his, like, not his whistle. adopted father. Yeah. And the arrow. You're going to be a Star Lord someday. <laughs> yes, that is pretty close to what I'm doing. It's cool now. So now the real thing is like this. They try. They almost managed to bluff the Breen. But then Mon and Locke decided to do an escape thing. And Locke offed himself by taking an overdose. And things could have been so simple for the last few episodes. But alas, now it's a race not between a courier and the whole Federation. But but this Primarch of the Breen Imperium and the entire Federation to find this Progenitor's tech and use it well, which means the fate of the that we saw in the time bug cycle is still very possible. Yeah. And then a few things that I found interesting is that Doc, I don't know if this is because of the reshoot business, is what I'm thinking every episode, but Doc, that the pre relic, relic wasn't there. And... I feel like that was probably a reshoot thing. And also, I just noticed when they're taking off, I'm just still like, you got back to HQ and you didn't even say what's up to Detmer and Owo, who are flying the Enterprise back, but I guess they can't. And I don't know if this is because of that, but it seems inter interesting to me that Saru is on a mission near Breen Space. And I wonder if that will come. You're, that's a great point, because I think I watched this and I was like, oh, there's a little side, there's Saru. And, and if, it's, mm -hmm. if there's no point to that, then there is no point. But I, there is yeah. nothing that ever doesn't have a point in discovery. Yeah. Usually they'd be like, Saru's doing something uh, somewhere else. But to say he's near the Breen Imperium that we could get intel somehow seems useful. Anyway, we're headed to the last. I think that's anything else you'd like to chat about in this episode? Nope. I mean, golly. We've got tons of Easter eggs. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We go immediately to the Easter egg desk with Stevie Man. Stevie, how are you today? Well, hi there, Rocky. <clears throat> that was a little bit deep. Oh, bravo. Thank you, thank you. We have tons of Easter eggs. And, you know, Discovery is just getting more and more into them. I don't, like, you know, Star Trek Strange New Worlds is just littered, littered with them. But Discovery, you know, we've got so, so many callbacks to DS9. But let's start with, so we have Nan. Nan comes back. And if we have forgotten who Nan was, she was part of the crew of the USS Enterprise under Pike. And she joined Discovery in season two in search for the Red Angel. And she stayed with the crew when they jumped to the future in season three. And let's not forget, she's probably... In fact, she is the only Enterprise Enterprise crew member from uh, the 23rd century who now lives in the 32nd century. So then we have the Dominion War Medical Research that you mentioned. Culber's doing this deep dive to learn more about the Breen to save Locke. And he also notes, or we note that this is interesting in light of Star Trek Picard Season 3, where we learned that Star Trek was secretly experimenting with changelings we wonder did perhaps Culber stumble upon any of that research mm. um, never turn your back on a breen that was a, a Romulan saying comes from deep space nine by inferno's light and obviously because Tarina is seemingly Vulcan and the Vulcans and the Romulans are the same people in the time of discovery as revealed in unification three wow. yes. uh, that they all live together on the planet Nivar mm -hmm. breen attack on the Federation we're reminded that the last time the Breen paid a visit to the Federation, they destroyed an entire city, referencing Deep Space Nine episode, The Changing Face of Evil. Do, 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 do. Tilly, we have Tilly being worried about her cadets, which is another reference to The Changing Face of Evil in Deep Space Nine. Tilly expresses her concern about her cadets' safety if the Breen attack Federation HQ. And in the Deep Space Nine era, Starfleet Academy was still located in San Francisco, although now it is not. That being said, the upcoming show, Starfleet Academy, will move back to Earth and San Francisco. Yes, news about that. 
We also learn that this episode and the next piece of the progenitor puzzle is a book called Labyrinths of the Mind, the Betasoid manuscript written by Dr. Marina Derex. And, nota bene, Marina is almost certainly a reference to Marina Sirtis, the beloved actress who's played the half-Betasoid character, Deanna Troy, in uh, Next Gen and Picard, a few cameos on Voyager and the Enterprise finale. So, love that. And let's see. So... The book was also written in 2371, which is the same year that USS Voyager left Space Station, Deep Space Nine oh. for the Badlands. It's also the same year that Thomas Riker stole the USS Defiant from that same station. Wild. Mm -hmm. uh... And it's also the year that USS Enterprise D crash landed its saucer section very famously in Viridian 3 in Star Trek Generations, which also God. means that it's the same year that a time displaced Captain James T. Kirk was killed. Big year. Good lord. Lots of big year. That's, that's an that Easter egg is just giant. That's huge. Jeez. Love that. Let's not forget Seven of Limes. I did. Can't love forget that. Seven of Limes. Is that? I wonder yeah. if it's some sort of you know futuristic margarita. <laughs> it has maybe, to be. Maybe I don't know. I I would love to recreate that somehow with some sort of Star Trek cocktail. I could do it. Mm. I know. Reno mentions a holodeck adventure for the littles. Now, that immediately made me think of the Star Trek Next Gen episode where they were all mini. You know, I think it was a, a classic transporter mistake, that one. However, nothing to do, that, that, that Easter egg doesn't play out in reality. But the most prominent holodeck adventure for children that we're aware of in Trek canon was The Adventures of Flotter, uh, which first appeared in the Voyager episode Once Upon a Time. And interestingly... These nerds, these writer nerds. In Picard season one, Soji had a flotter lunchbox. Oh, yes. You, that's insane to me. That's nuts, isn't it? Just so nerdy. And it must have been so like nerdy. in the background on some sort of yeah. shelf before she... Oh, flutter! Right, before she yeah. got stolen from her home or, you know, kidnapped yeah. and all that. Let's see. The Badlands. So by the end of the episode, the Eternal Gallery's location, and thus the location of the book, Labyrinths of the Mind, is revealed to be in the Badlands, which is an unstable area of space, which was first mentioned in, you guessed it, Deep Space Nine. Correct. Although the Badlands is most famous as the area where the USS Voyager went missing in its 1995 debut, Caretaker, the concept of the Badlands was first introduced a year earlier in 1994 in DS9's second season, The Maquis Part One. Mm. And the Badlands mm. is lo located what used, near what used to be Cardassian space. So in its next episode, Discovery, Discovery will literally be traveling directly to the neighborhood of Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea if the wormhole is still there in this time period. Indeed. Mm. Well, Terok Nor, <laughs> as the Cardassians <laughs> called it. Well, so, yeah. Or if the old station is still alive and kicking. Um, but as Discovery continues to drop surprises in its final season, we can keep our fingers crossed for a glimpse of a very special space station. Space station. Space station. I would love that. That was good. Oh, I wish I had my... well, that... It's on tour. Anyway, sorry. That is all the Easter eggs I have. Aki, it is back to you in the studio. Thank you so much, Stevie. And now we go immediately to news. Oh, let's go to news. News around the galaxy. So, we have two bits of exciting news. So, okay. This is big news, I think, or, or potentially. So Terry Metalis, showrunner for Picard, has recently accepted a job at Disney Plus, and he is to lead Marvel's WandaVision sequel series. Oh, my goodness. I know. And I think that's led a lot of Trek fans to have some hmm, consternation about what hope there might still be for a legacy follow-up series. Sorry, for a legacy Picard follow-up series. And also, I think, with Paramount Plus up for sale... I don't know, plans of a new spin-off series are looking a little far off at this point yeah. anyway. Yeah. But Metallus apparently is still holding out hope for a spin-off series saying, look, anything is possible. We certainly wouldn't be like, oh no, we aren't going to do a movie. So potentially it's a movie, but I think he's mm. hoping out for a series. And he said, for me, I would just need this crew. I would need this cast. And as long as that was a possibility, we would figure something out. Yes, a series is ideal because there's so many stories to tell and the 25th century in general in Star Trek is such a rich thing. Mm, so tell me about it. Let's hope. Let's hold out hope. Let's, hope. let's, let's have right. faith in okay. that. Let's have faith. Oh, the heart. 
And our other bit of news, this was this was revealed this week. Holly Hunter has joined the cast of Starfleet Academy. Oh, hmm. I missed that. I think I missed that entirely. She's joined the cast as Chancellor and co-runners Alex Kurtzman and Nag- Noga Landau said, it feels like we spent our entire lives watching Holly Hunter be a stone cold genius. To have her extraordinary authenticity, fearlessness, mm sense of humor and across the board brilliance leading the charge on Starfleet Academy is a gift to all of us and to the enduring legacy of Star Trek. Wow. So it's still in pre-production. Wow-y, wow-y, wow-y. I know. Wow. Yeah. It is okay. still in pre-production. Starfleet Academy will be filmed over in Pinewood Studios in Toronto, the former mm-hmm. home of Star Trek Discovery. So they've got that big AI AR wall, the big, the big wall. Yeah. So and filming is expected to take place later this summer. And so it will house the largest standing set ever used in a Star Trek production. So I think we can assume that this new Starfleet Academy series is going to be big production budget. All right. I'm in. Let's go. Let's go. Well, that's Uh, all from the news. Shall we move on to quotable moments? Let's. Quotable moments. Well, there's quite a few in this bad boy. I'll start by mentioning Rainer's, you know, super angry Breen. And he says, the word diplomacy is not even in their vocabulary. And then Ray- and Trina says, then we will teach it to them. And then Rainer says, it's more of a pipe dream than a tactic. Ooh, ooh. Mal and Locke and Michael, they say some things are worse than death. And Ma- Michael says, what's worse than death? And Mal says, this conversation, for starters. Which... Snappy repartee when every the universe hangs in the balance. That's all I'll say. Okay. Oh, I was going to say Jet Reno just always has so many. Uh, let's get ready to rumble. Yes, yes. Oh God, I for, I forget every time about that punch. <laughs> Good lord. Um, I think you probably have the the exact ones, but you know, she was talking about the train and she the breen and she said it's the faceless helmets, truncheon vibes. Where's the nuance? Where's the nuance, Where's the baby? Nuance? And when asked about I think being a an antique an antique book expert, she said, Oh, I might have padded my resume a little with that one. I love that so <laughs> Reno had a resume. Yes. Yeah. And then her Seven of Limes reference was just I loved it. We gotta be making seven of limes out there. Do we have our seven of limes? She's seven of Seven of limes. limes. <laughs> yeah, it's seven of limes. That's so dumb that we did that. That's just like one of my favorite jobs. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, <laughs> She's seven of limes. I mean, that would be pretty good for an ad. It would. It's like a refreshing seven of limes. Mountain I also Dew. enjoyed you, <laughs> Mountain Dew seven of <laughs> limes. Good God. When Trina bluffs the uh, Breen saying that they needed to come up with extradition orders, Michael says, extradition orders? And Trina says, it seemed preferable to claims of a triple infestation. Which I thought was very cute. How Navarians lie. I just, uh, I mean, if I was ever going to get a tattoo, and I won't because I'm afraid of needles, it would be what the Primarch says right before he leaves sickbay. He says, intention is nothing. Outcome is everything. I just feel it's very, very Klingon esque, but sure, cool. That's intent all I got. versus impact. That's really what he's saying. That's what he's saying, baby. That's basically That's therapy. What he's speak. Saying. Come on, the Breen are in touch, bro. The Breen are awoke. <laughs> Shall we move on to next time? Let's move on to next time. Next time on Set Phasers. Next time on Set Phasers, we'll discuss episode eight of season five. Of Star Trek Discovery entitled Labyrinths. So that should be very exciting. I'm sure it's very straightforward. 
Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for hopefully downloading this. If you liked what you heard today and you have never heard this podcast before, hey, head over to wherever you get your podcast from and and look us up. We got everything. We just covered Discover. We've covered Picard. We've covered Lower Decks. We've covered Strange New Worlds. We're talking about Trek over here, baby. Find us. Yeah, find us on YouTube. Find us on Apple Podcasts. Wherever you get your podcasts is always good. We have lots of cool new things on YouTube that we're we're playing with. And yeah, what's what's coming up next episode, Aki? Oh, you know, probably like a puzzle or like a maze or like something like that. And like trying to figure out like, what does that mean for like humanity? Like, what are you finding at the bottom of what, and like the inside of like this maze? Like what is consciousness and like what is responsibility? And like, how do you use that impactfully as uh, beings that could create life in another galaxy? That's my guess. That was, I love that bit. I've never seen you do that bit before. You like that That's bit? <laughs> it was like you were like this sort of Californian guy at college or uh, something. Yeah. I don't know what that was, but that's when you asked me that, that's what came out. Oh, loved it. Why did we do that? We're in the, we're in the next time. We're out of mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Also find us, find us on Instagram and hey, share us with your friends or whatever. If they like Star Trek, they'll like this. Totally. Well, that's it from me. I am Stevie Mans. And I will speak in your tongue so there can be no misunderstanding. And this has been Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. Computer and program.